Hey fans, so here we are in the Cheyenne Roundhouse next to the turntable, and today we're going to be running a nice long round trip freight scenario with the big boy. Alright, so I have 4008 loaded up here, and we're going to be taking her out for a little spin. So part of the reason I'm running this scenario today is because I've just made some uh, pretty major updates to the mod for this locomotive. Um, the chief change of which is a fix for the brakes on the freight cars, uh, specifically the reefer cars, um, so that you don't get that... Uh, bungee cord effect when you apply the brakes and release the brakes. Uh, it's just kind of annoying when you're trying to actually keep the train at a set speed when you're going down uh, a grade. So I'll be demonstrating that as part of today's video. I've also made some updates to the operating physics for the big boy locomotive. Uh, so our fuel consumption and our uh, water consumption is a little more accurate. So we're going to take a trip out of the roundhouse, um, stop by the locomotive service facilities to fill up on water and coal, and then we'll shuffle on over to the yard to pick up our consist.
So this is going to be the breakdown for our run. Uh, basically my plan is to take this string of empty reefer cars. I believe I have this concept set up as about a 110 empty reefers with caboose. So it's about 3,300 tons. We'll be heading up over line 3, which is 0.82% uh, grade. Uh, a 4,000 class locomotive was rated for 5,800 tons over line 3. So 3,300 tons is well within the capabilities of uh, 4,008 today. Um, and on the way back, we will swap out this string of empties for a string of 74 loaded reefers, which will weigh in at 4,450 tons. Uh, once again, ruling grade coming uh, east back eastbound is going to be 0.82%. Uh, so once again, 4,400 tons well within the tonnage rating of 5,800 tons for this locomotive. I'm using 4,008 today because there is a Trains Magazine article that documents a run with the 4,008 uh, over this line with this kind of consist. So I'm basically using this to recreate uh, a little bit of history here, um, which I think is pretty neat. The route that I'm running this scenario on is the 1950s Sherman Hill route. Uh, it's released online. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, you can download this, install it. I've made some uh, modifications and adjustments to it. As you can see, I've added in some uh, B and LE uh, coaling assets and water assets uh, just because I like those better than the uh, horseshoe curve assets that are used here. All right, water is filled. Let's pull up for some coal. Alright, coal is full, let's drill this locomotive on over to the yard. So one of the changes I've made, uh, as you can see right now, is I've lowered the maximum uh, valve stroke cutoff to 81%, um, which is accurate. Uh, the Union Pacific used a reverse gear quadrant that would allow maximum travel to be 80.8%, so this is good. Um, I've also made some adjustments to the steam generation and the coal consumption physics. 
Uh, maximum steam output from the boiler is going to be 125,000 pounds of steam per hour. Uh, and at that steam generation, you should be burning, uh, I believe it's 11 tons of coal. 11 tons of coal. 22,000 pounds of coal an hour. Water consumption is directly tied to steam generation, so if you need a reference point, 100,000 pounds of steam is the equivalent of 12,000 gallons of water. So you can do your math there. All in all, about full steam, uh, you, uh, you get about, uh, I'd say, two hours of runtime off of one tender's load of fuel, which is pretty accurate. So we have to move pretty far up the line to get over to the yard leads that will allow us to back down onto our train, um, almost to the CNS bridge. As many of you probably know, Smokebox is working on his uh, 4000 series big boy, which I'm sure many of us can't wait for. So uh, honestly, I'm, I'm just giddy with excitement just thinking about it. That that version of the big boy is going to be the most detailed, most accurate piece of eye candy and just simulation physics that's all around. Um, so just keep an eye on that uh, when, you know, screenshots and videos start dropping on his page and things like that. I think he said he was hoping to get this done by uh, the end of the year, which is a pretty good goal uh, based on how much work he needs to put into all that stuff. Alright, so this is the lead that we need to back down onto the train. Let's get past the switch here. And then we'll apply full independence to bring the locomotive to a stop.
back in the day, fruit blocks like the ones that are going to be running today were a real big commodity uh, and a really big money generator for railroads. Um, railroads, railroads, excuse me, that were basically the only way to move produce of this kind over from the west coast to the markets in the east coast. So big companies like Pacific Fruit Express were established uh, and purchased hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, refrigerated boxcars to basically transport all of this fresh produce from California and, and, and the, the west coast farm farmlands to the east coast markets for distribution and sale. So loaded trains would be eastbound and empty trains would be westbound. Exactly what we're going to be doing today. Okay, so we are hitched to our train uh, once again. This is a 110 car empty reefer drag caboose on the rear makes, I believe, 111. I don't remember. I, I, I dropped the set in here a while ago. Um, like I said, consist weight is 3,300 tons, well below the 5,800 ton rating limit for this locomotive over this ruling grade. So, let's do the brake test and set up and ready to go. Get ready to go, excuse me. Alright, seems like we're pretty good. Um, <laughs> before the brake fix, if you were to do that brake test like that, the, the, the rubber band effect would have launched this train into, like, I think the rearward direction at, like, 20 miles an hour or some dumb crap like that. Uh, but as you can see, that did not happen, so I will take that as a successful brake fix. Um, let me know if any of the other freight cars in the Wasatch uh, grade rolling stock pack need this brake fix uh, because I've only done the reefer cars. I haven't actually looked at any of the other cars in the uh, package, namely the coal box or the livestock cars. Um, but I'm more than happy to go in and adjust the braking codes for those cars as well if those cars need to be adjusted. Uh, Alright, so let's head on up into the cab and prepare to depart. All 
Alright, so we are lined all the way into Laramie. So we should be good to go. Okay, another minor adjustment I've made to the locomotive physics here is I've adjusted the optimal fire mass for the firebox. Um, fire, total fire mass in the firebox is now set to one ton of coal, 2,000 pounds. I set the optimal fire mass to be 1,950 pounds of coal, which equates to 97.5% uh, fire mass in the firebox. Um, this is, my reasoning behind doing that is to simulate the fact that Union Pacific used very low quality, uh, Rock Springs coal from Wyoming, which I believe had a BTU of only 12,000 per, uh, pound of coal, uh, versus some of the Eastern coal BTUs, which were upwards of 14,000 to 16,000 BTU, um, per pound. Uh, so you would need to be, uh, you would need to fire this locomotive more aggressively to get the same amount of power, uh, out of it, uh, versus some of the eastern steam locomotives like the, uh, CNO Allegheny. Of course, as, uh, right now my throttle is only part, part open, and I'm not really traveling too fast. I'm in the yard. My burn rate for the fire is not terribly high, which is why our stoker is able to quickly fill the coal in the firebox. Um, once you get onto the main line and you're really climbing up those grades, you have the throttle all the way open and the reverse gear as far forward as you can have it uh, without exceeding the boiler generation. Uh, boiler steam generation capacity, um, your burn rate in the firebox will be much higher, which means the stoker will have a much harder time keeping up with the uh, coal demand. Although the cold, I've set the coal demand, uh, the coal demand to never be higher than the maximum stoking rate. Obviously, so the maximum stoking rate is uh, 11 tons per hour. So you're never going to burn more than 11 tons per hour. Um, so at the very worst, you'll maintain the same fire mass in the firebox. You will never actually lose fire mass in the firebox with the stoker on.
Obviously this is a very famous spot for train watchers back in the day, and maybe still is. Um, you see big boys blasting out of Cheyenne Yard with freight trains coming under the CNS bridge right there. So as we're going upgrade in a conventional steam locomotive, uh, we're going to try to keep water level between 85 and 90 percent on the glass. Uh, if I recall right, the water level is visible on the glass uh, at 95 percent boiler level to 75 percent boiler level. The crown sheet is, I believe it's around 67 percent boiler level, um, so obviously you never really want to fall below. Uh, the bottom of the water glass unless you're going down a steep grade or something but um so yeah we're gonna activate the injector and keep that water level above the halfway point as, as far as we are as long as we are climbing the grade
So as you can see, at a maximum steam generating capacity in the boiler, uh, it really heats up that coal pretty quick in the firebox. So when you're doing this kind of operation with a heavy drag behind you climbing, you basically have to keep the stoker on most of the time. Uh, so you really reach uh, very close to that uh, 11 ton per hour coal consumption number. Funny, there's a random milk jug on the ground right in front of us.
So just a little bit more history. Uh, Line 3 was built um, over Sherman Hill to reduce the ruling grade westbound from 1.55% down to 0.82% to match the eastbound ruling grade uh, and therefore allow longer trains to be run by a single locomotive uh, heading westbound. The routing of Line 3 uh, adds a couple dozen miles to the trip. I don't, I don't exactly recall how many miles off the top of my head, but it's it's long enough of a detour that it requires a uh, service stop for fuel at Harriman, um, which is the namesake of this line, the Harriman Cutoff. Uh, so we will be making that fuel stop in Harriman. Um, we'll see how much fuel we actually have left over uh, by the time we get to the servicing depot at Harriman. Yes, before anyone says anything, I realize that my computer is a piece of crap. This is still the laptop that's running the uh, GTX 860M card, which is quite old at this point. I'm looking at a couple of replacement PCs that have the newer RTX uh, 2070 or 2080. Um, I'm, but I am holding off on purchasing a new gaming PC probably uh, until the Smokebox uh, 4000 starts to, you know, that gets dropped um, so I can actually justify spending over $2,000 on a gaming PC. Um, get better frames out of this horribly optimized game.
So, so far I've been operating uh, with the reverse gear close to full gear, which is really uh, increasing my steam consumption and steam generation rates, which has been burning through my water supply in the tender. So, right now, I, as you can see, I've, I've hooked the reverse gear back up to about 65% cutoff. Um, that's allowing me to let the fire mass actually drop well below uh, the maximum sustainable fire mass. So we're, we're currently at about 72% fire mass and the uh, boiler is still generating enough steam to maintain steam pressure at 300 pounds and actually even lift the safety valves. Um, and also because we're not evaporating as much water, the, in, the exhaust steam injector is able to refill the boiler much faster than it would be under uh, full steam. So let's go into the F5 heads up display and see how much uh, we're actually evaporating and using. So uh, before you might have noticed that we were running about 120,000 pounds uh, steam generation rate and the usage rate was also close to about 120 uh, thousand pounds. Uh, with the reverse gear hooked back up to 60, uh, 65% uh, stroke, you're actually close to 100,000 uh, pounds steam generation and only about 90,000 pounds steam usage, uh, which would dramatically increase your range, operating range, and your economy. Also, it doesn't really um, the way I have the physics coded, the um, the tractive effort doesn't actually fall that far um, until you go below either, I think it's either 35% cutoff or 30% cutoff. Um, obviously at 81% cutoff you have 100% tractive effort, uh, but I have it scaled so that as you notch back on the reverse gear, you're only losing a little bit of the rated tractive effort down to 35 or 30 percent. At that value, 35 or 30 percent, I think I have the tractive effort rated at 95 percent of full tractive effort at 30 or 35 percent cutoff, which means you could theoretically start the train, um, you could actually start the train at a 35% cutoff. I mean, you couldn't do that in real life, but of course, um, <clears throat> this with this locomotive uh, lacking any advanced scripting, uh, I had to compromise a little bit on the realism of the reverse gear and the relation to the tractive effort physics. Um, but yeah, so of course, uh, if you're looking for a long, if you're going the long route and you're uh, climbing for quite a while, that's smart to hook back the reverse gear, probably to maybe 65 to 50 percent um, climbing with uh, a load that's well below the rated tonnage rating for this locomotive, that way you can conserve uh, fuel and water. As you can see, we're holding about 50% uh, firebox mass, uh, fuel mass and firebox right now, and we're still generating positive, uh, we have a positive steam generation rate, so uh, let's go back to the F5 HUD and see what that HUD is doing. In real life, it was said that the uh, 4000s were operated 
full throttle going upgrade with tonnage and the reverse gear notched back as far as possible um, because with the reverse gear notched too far forward the locomotives would actually burn through their cylinder lubrication oil uh, well before they could reach a point where the oil could be refilled. Um, so it is actually realistic to run this locomotive going upgrade with tonnage behind the drawbar um, with the throttle all the way open and to notch back that reverse gear as far back as you possibly can without losing speed or impairing steam generation, etc, etc, etc. So um, I might actually even notch back a little bit more. Um, especially considering uh, when you are notched back in this mod, it, it's kind of hard to maintain the uh, fire level in the firebox at an optimum rate. I have the uh, boiler response to uh, firing changes in the firebox set so that there is a bit of a lag between the um, <clears throat> between the response, the firing response you get in the boiler and uh, uh, the uh, actual fuel mass number. So, operating this locomotive, um, it requires attention to detail and uh, just general attentiveness uh, on your part as the engineer slash fire. As you can see, uh, I think I was at close to 40% or 40% fire mass. And we turned on the stoker, we're now at 46% and our steam generation rate is back in the positive. So this is very, it does, um, it does respond fairly well, you just have to be paying attention. I think we're uh, within 10 miles of the fueling stop at Harriman, so I'm pretty sure we'll make it before we run out of fuel. Uh, well, I mean, we'll definitely make it before we run out of coal, but we, we will also make it before we run out of water. So, I think the water was what I was concerned about earlier, because I had to cut off notch too far forward.
Alright, it's looking with ten four miles of Harriman finally. Uh, we should be there probably in the next ten minutes or so, based on the speed that we're traveling at. Uh, we'll stop at the fueling depot and replenish the coal supply and the water and the tender. And then we'll continue along our way up to the summit and down into Laramie, where we'll turn the locomotive, uh, refuel it at the uh, servicing area by the roundhouse, and then hook it up to the eastbound loaded fruit block for a return to Cheyenne.
All right, we're coming up on the fueling station at Harriman, so we're gonna drop back on the throttle and start to uh, lose some speed so we can spot the tender right under the spouts, the water spout, and the coaling tower. would also uh, double as a greasing stop, so uh, I don't know if they had dedicated grease men here, but they would, they probably would, I think. Most locomotives that would stop here for fuel would also get the rods greased and stuff. Okay, let's get this tender refueled and continue on our way. So as you notice, there is a little bit of uh, 
slippage. Uh, the contest does drag back a little bit, even though it, the brakes aren't fully applied. That is just a bug in the game. So, to get the uh, coal bunker under the, the, the coal chute again.
we are out of Airmen and running along at a pretty good clip, uh, actually. Um, I took a little bit of a break, uh, for dinner, uh, after the fueling stuff in Airmen, and I came back a couple hours later, so I don't really know exactly, uh, what happened. I, I didn't do anything, I just left the game on pause for like two hours, but we're getting quite a bit better performance here than we were in the first part of the climb. We only were averaging about 17 to 17 and a half miles an hour going up uh, between Cheyenne and Harriman, and now coming out of Harriman, we're, we're, we're cracking 30 miles an hour here, which is nice. Um, which is, I think, actually probably more realistic uh, in terms of speed-wise for this kind of tonnage over the screen. Like I said, we're we're running with um, <clears throat> we're running with 3,300 tons behind the tender drawbar, which is uh, what's that like 2,500 tons below the. 500 tons below the rated tonnage for this locomotive. So we should, this is the speed I think that we should be doing, uh, at least maintaining, so let's activate it. Let's uh, keep that uh, injector going now. stop um, will probably be Hermosa. Uh, we're going to stop at Hermosa and probably I will evaluate whether or not we need to quote unquote uh, turn up the retainers on the last couple of cards of Consus. Um, we might not have to. The drop down to Laramie is not a terribly steep grade. Um, I might be able to handle the train speed just by uh, uh, working the train brakes. But uh, definitely on the way back to Cheyenne, dropping down that 1.55% grade with that 4,400-ton train behind me, I'm probably going to need to turn up the retainers on the last 15 to 20 cars. But we'll see.
raid levels out a little bit here in Kirkens, so we might be able to pick up a decent amount of speed.
working for most of the tunnel, so let's take care of the windows, turn the blower on, and shut the stover off. Alright, so we have a full service brake applied, the deceleration rate is satisfactory, and there wasn't, there wasn't any springiness, the brakes didn't all come on at once, which is nice. Come to a stop at this signal here, and we'll start setting some retainers for the trip down into Laramie.
Okay, so for those of you people who do not know what a retainer is, this uh, device is part of the brake system on the cars. It uh, was used back in the days before dynamic braking was a thing. Of course, uh, you know that dynamic braking is a feature of diesel and electric locomotives that turns the traction motors into generators and thus creates a a force against the train that retards its speed. Um, that method of braking obviously saves a lot of wear and tear on the brake equipment, especially the brake shoes. Excuse me, the brake shoes and the wheels. But of course, steam locomotives did not have electric motors and therefore did not have dynamic braking. Um, of course, there are some instances of steam locomotives that were able to reverse their cylinders or whatever. There was like a form of steam dynamic braking, but that's very rare. Um, obviously, the 4000s, the 4000s did not have that feature. So, the solution uh, instead to maintaining train speed going down hills um, back in the days of purely air braking was the system of retainers and what these retainers would do is they would actually retain a certain amount of brake uh, brakes air brake pressure excuse me air brake pressure in the brake cylinders so say 10 15 20 pounds uh, per square inch in the brake cylinders even though the brake handle on the locomotive the train brake handle was in the released position um, now of course there are guidelines as to how many cars you want to set the retainers up on depending on the uh, tonnage of the train and the uh, severity of the downgrade um, I don't have that technically on hand uh, that information on hand so I don't know I'm not I'm just sort of I'm just sort of going to guess my way through how many cars I'm gonna activate the retainers on now one thing to note is that retainers don't actually exist in this game, um, at least functionally speaking. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to set handbrakes. Um, and that will simulate the function of the retainer. So we're going to set handbrakes. I would say probably on the rear 15 cars should do for this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Ah, eh, well, I mean, we got a hundred ten cars, maybe twenty cars. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. All right, our quote-unquote retainers are set up on the rear of the train, minus the caboose, because I'm not gonna. I don't. I don't know if cabooses were equipped with retainers or not. They probably were, but I'm not gonna use it here. I don't think I'm gonna need it. Um, and that should do it. Let's release the brakes and get ready to roll down the hill. Obviously, we're not going to be working a lot of steam going down the hill, so I'm not going to be running the stoker all that much. We shouldn't be uh, evaporating too much water out of the boiler either. Um, of course, we're going downhill now, so we actually want to let the boiler... Uh, water level run down a little bit. We want to hold it around probably 70, between 75 and 80 percent water level in the glass. So there's that as well. All right, release the brakes. Let's head out.
So, another reason for retainers um, on trains such as this would be the fact that the brakes, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, are direct release brakes uh, as opposed to graduated release brakes. So, basically the difference between a direct release brake and a graduated release brake is that if you have a graduated release brake, you can partially bail off your brake application. You can go from a full brake to a partial brake without having to fully release and reapply. With a direct release brake, there is no way to graduate or slowly bleed off your brakes. You have to fully release the brakes um, before you reapply them, which makes uh, modulating your brake applications a bit tricky, um, which is why these retainers were set up. It's interesting, I seem to have hit a roadblock of some sort. Let's see. All right, this game's physics is being wacky. All right, let's. Uh, this you typically is not possible. Um, you should not be able to release retainers while the train is in motion because the conductor actually has to walk from the caboose, or the rear brakeman has to walk from the caboose uh, up the length of the train to uh, turn the retaining valves on each of the cars that he wants to set the retainers on. So this is kind of weird, uh, but I guess we'll play by ear here. It's possible I might, I might have set the handbrake uh, 
values for these reefers a little high. I'm going to have to go in and take a look at what I set that number to again. Possibly lower it a little bit. Make it a little more realistic. So maximum timetable speed for freight uh, through here is technically 50 miles an hour, so we will try to adhere to that speed limit.
So I guess the way the game handles slack is still a little too much for uh, the accurate use of retainers. Um, so I think I might just end up controlling train speed with the train brake. So on extended downhill runs uh, back in the steam days, what trains would have to do is they would actually have to pull over into a siding and uh, stop for about 10 to 15 minutes and actually allow the uh, train brakes to cool because uh, cast iron brake shoes against the wheels would become so hot that the brakes would actually become ineffective at slowing the train.
so we're approaching a stretch of more level track here, so I might actually have to work the throttle a little bit. That's why I've cracked open the uh, cracked open the stoker and started putting coal back in the firebox.
Okay, so we're going to drop this consist off on yard track number 5, then we'll cut the locomotive off the front end and run it around to the shop for refueling and turning. I, I'm hoping the turntable is long enough to turn this thing. I, I haven't actually tested to see the if the turntable at Laramie will hold a 4000 class locomotive. I mean, it sh in real life it does, so it should in the game, but you know, this is... Obviously, this is this is dovetail, so you can't really ever trust anything. But uh, as long as long as we can turn the locomotive around after we fuel it, it should be we should be good to go. If not, then I'm gonna have to run around the Y, which is annoying. But then we will uh, bring the locomotive back into the yard and uh, couple it onto this once again 74 car loaded reefer train weighing in at. 4,450 tons. Then we'll have to set some switches to make sure our path back to Cheyenne is all well and good, and then we should set off. Alright, let's set handbrakes and stuff.
Okay, moment of truth. Time to find out whether or not this turntable is long enough for a 4,000. Well, at any rate, doesn't seem to want to line up, so let's see. Okay, so, uh, I actually had to make a route edit to have this turntable even sort of spin into the correct track position. So, this, obviously, this turntable is broken. It doesn't want to spin for me. So, I'm going to see if I can edit this again with the locomotive on it. Perhaps I can get this thing to spin around the way I want it to. You're obviously not going to see it spin around, but, I mean, that is just the way it is. Okay, so obviously you can't do that, um, and I have completely destroyed this locomotive. Okay, so we're scrapping the plans to run back to uh, Cheyenne with that load, but I think um, I've demonstrated what I wanted to demonstrate here today, so this makes for a, a good run nonetheless. I'm going to have to fix a turntable now, which is annoying because now it, now it freaking turns. Whereas it wouldn't turn before. Piece of crap. Um, so, yeah. Everything that you need to know about this mod is in the description. Uh, so, do go ahead and expand and read it. Um, if you have any questions, comments, uh, always feel free to give me a shout out in the comment section. I'll do my best to answer. Um, and, yeah, sure. I will see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.